Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Kate Bosler. Kate Bosler is an investigative environmental journalist and a graduate student at Columbia University. She researches solutions for protecting biodiversity and has worked with land-based communities and wildlife defenders throughout Latin America. Her interest is in chronicling community-led resistance to exploitation and ecological abuse to inspire resistance elsewhere. And today we're going to talk about whales. So first, uh, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thanks, Derek. Pleasure to be here. Um, so why don't you just provide us with a quick introduction to whales? Sure. Well, I mean, the very short version is that we just don't know a lot about whales. They're some of the most elusive creatures on the planet. They spend 99% of their lives underwater, far beyond any of our observational tools. And even with the sliver of what we do know, it's it's so fascinating. We've only barely begun to understand their rich languages and music. It wasn't even common knowledge before 1970s that whales could sing. We heard them singing on these amazing recorders, uh, recordings that were, were released then, and it was part of what inspired this this great effort to, to save them, and we can get into that. Um, but we don't even know their migration routes and where they go in the oceans. Uh, a few re- years ago, we discovered a new, you know, I, I have trouble with the word discover because it's not like they're just out there waiting for us to discover them, but they were discovered to science um, a few years ago off the coast of, De- of Japan, a new um, species of beaked whale. There are about 89, 70 species of cetaceans known to science, and cetaceans include whales, dolphins, and, and uh, porpoises. And they're, they're generally cat- categorized into uh, baleen whales and, and toothed whales. So when you think of baleen, baleen whales, they're the, the massive gentle giants, the blue whales, which was one of the biggest creatures ever to exist on, on planet Earth. Uh, some fun facts, you know, like their heart is the size of a car. Their tongue alone weighs more than an elephant. Um, it's said that they can fill 2,000 balloons with a single breath, which I hope no one actually goes out and tries to test this. That would be a lot of plastic pollution that we don't want. Uh, some other baleen, baleen whales are right whales, humpback whales are some of the most studied ones, minke whales, gray whales. And so, you know, even understanding like where their feeding grounds are and we're using tools like GPS to try to locate them. And that's really important so we can avoid collisions with ships and some of these other threats that we'll also talk uh, talk more in depth about. And uh, and they really um, I mean, they're so they're just so intriguing. They have some of the biggest brains uh, and we're starting to try to come up all these different experiments to try to like interact with them and, and have conversations even. Um, so it's, it's really a shame because I studied lots of different animals and I fall so in love with them and what they're capable of. And at the same time, I'm learning how we're losing them and the richness that they bring to the world and how that's being lost as well. So you quote in, in the article, which is, which is called um, Save the Whales Again, You quote, uh, let me find this, you quote uh, Matthew Savoca uh, as saying, quote, large baleen and sperm were the dominant consumers in many ocean ecosystems. And that's pretty extraordinary. They're, they're, I mean, they're drivers of the entire natural community then. Can you talk a little bit about um, what we know, at least, of traditional... By traditional, I mean before they were wiped out by humans. Uh, traditional, um, and I hate the word roles, but the, the what roles they played in their natural communities. It's like you know, wolves mm-hmm. will chase deer out of bottomlands and actually improve habitat for trout. And beavers, of course, drive entire natural communities. Um, elephants drive changes between forest and savanna. Can you can you talk about what roles a lot of the whales played? And I want to say one thing and then I'll shut up, which is that uh, I read that sperm whales uh, were a huge mover of iron from the depths to the surfaces because they would dig dive really deep, eat squid who are rich in iron, and then they would poop it out when they're near the surface. So that's just one role they would play. So can you take all that mishmash and go somewhere with it. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's hard with words like role because so much of the vernacular we use for ecology is seeing the rest of the world as utility and whales are not spared from being uh, talked about and studied about in this way. Uh, I prefer to think of them as as bookends holding up the stories of lots of other creatures in the sea. And if we topple enough bookends or these keystone species, if you want to use an ecological term, then you're also losing the stories and the lives of lots of other species. You mentioned, uh, you know, squid and uh, some of the microorganisms and and creatures, plankton that live in, in different depths. I mean, even the the poop of whales is significant to the ecosystems. It's known as marine snow. It's nutrient rich and it drifts down. And that's how some of these smaller life forms are getting some of their their only uh, substance. So if you remove whales, I mean, we don't even know the the, the entire effects of, of what's happened yet. We're only beginning to glimpse you know, this, this huge massive loss that we've created. I mean, in the last century, we've lost we, three, three million whales. That's a low estimate, um, just taken out of the oceans. And so you, you see these things like you just had mentioned the, uh, the other connections between all of these different species on land. You see the same thing and it's, it's called a trophic cascade. So you remove that, that massive life form at the top of the food chain and that's going to affect permeate through the the entire uh food chain uh including some of these these smaller animals um and we really you know we need them for for climate stability our fates as as with our own species uh let alone all the other ones are completely bound up in the lives of whales i mean their their bodies store a massive amount of carbon they they help the ecosystem to flourish all of these different fish that are, you know, then in turn eaten by by other animals. And um, and the plankton alone are providing so much. It's it's something like a fifth of the oxygen and globally. So we don't really know the extent of the damage that we're doing by removing them. But it's it's gravely significant. Can you talk for a bit about I mean, do you have any anecdotes for how common whales were like i know i know just a couple one of them is that uh off the coast of new england there were so many whales and same with with uh, around san francisco there were so many whales that it was perpetually foggy from their breath and also you could smell evidently their breath does not smell the best to humans (laughs) and you could you could smell the whale breath on the on the coast that's how many there were um so so can you give you know, I, okay, so I live on the coast, and like twice in the 20 years I've lived here, I've been standing at the coast and looking out and seeing just a, a very specific glint that says there's a whale. So I've only seen a couple whales, but can you talk about how common they were at one point? I think of blue whales, and again, when you think of a number like a few hundred thousand, each weighing 150 tons. And that presence in the sea is just, it, it's hard to fathom and, and beautiful. And at one point in the 1970s, their numbers were down to 200 individuals. There's this book that put out was put out, I think it was just called, uh, you know, Life of a Blue Whale that won a big prize and called some attention to this and went into the history which was this uh, this expedition by um, by Captain Cook um, in the 1700s to the Antarctic? He went back and reported to to Europe that he saw you know tons of blue whales. And what happened? Well, they went there to ground zero of concentration of these whales, and they hunted them to near into oblivion. Um, their numbers have recovered. They're estimated from a few thousand to, you know, maybe 10,000. There are about five subspecies of blue whale. So in total, about 10,000 individuals now, which from 200 is, it's something, it's not nothing, but not nearly what it was before. And this is a common story for almost all species of whales. There are uh, 14 species of baleen whale that I had mentioned before, and six of them are listed as critically uh, endangered, um, the northern right whale being the northern right Atlantic whale being the most endangered of all of them with something like 400 individuals left. So when you think about 
uh, a male and a female from different family pods need to meet up and reproduce. I mean, even the loss of one individual could determine the fate of, of this species, which we might see go extinct. Very, very likely we'll see go extinct in our lifetimes. Um, and all whales are existing in just vestiges of the population numbers that, that they once did. So I, I don't know how you or anyone would know the answer to this, but if there's only 400 of you or only 200 of you, like in, with the blue whales, um, how do you, how do you find a mate in the entire ocean? <laughs> um, that's a good question. And some of the, the answers to parse this is definitely encoded in their, in their gorgeous songs. And the males are singing of, of the baleen whales and they're communicating things like how to find mates and, uh, of course, the music deeply affects us and, and resonates with us. I, I want to just go ahead and give credit to species like whales and other creatures for coming up with, with singing. I mean, humans by no means invented singing. That's something we inherited from, from other species. Um, but from a biological standpoint, I mean, it, I, I don't know exactly what the, what the population interactions are, uh, just that it's, it's really critical that, you know, we keep that number, um, taking the, the right whales at the example around, uh, or as high as it can be. I mean, it, they really can't, can't afford to lose any, any members of their families at this point. And how, do you know the answer to how, how far they can hear each other? Yeah, so this was actually extremely controversial. Uh, Katie and Roger Payne, a then married couple of biologists in the 1970s, were the first to, uh, and I, I want to make an aside that I'm speaking from um, a history of scientific knowledge that tends to be, you know, more European and, and white centered and have, there's a whole history of, of uh, whale knowledge and, in relationships with whales that predates all of this, all of the science, scientific understanding. I'm not going to speak to that because I don't have, that's not my expertise. Um, but they were credited with, uh, popularizing widely, um, the fact that, that whales sing. And, uh, Roger Payne put out a paper, uh, in the early 1970s saying that their songs could travel for thousands of miles under sea. And there was huge pushback on it. I mean, he lost his funding, his reputation was, was mired. And it was just this, this moment of, you know, complete hubris and arrogance and refusal to believe that this creature could not only sing, but, um, you know, generate a sound that's capable of, of traveling this just great distance. I mean, to be an individual in that, that family and, and hear something coming from, from that far away. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary and a huge advantage. Which also, by the way, might answer part of the question of how they find, how they find lovers. Yeah. 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 Maybe, uh, you know, if, if their population numbers are, are high enough, I could see that getting a little overwhelming, wondering which direction to swim. True. Um, okay. So what happened to them? Uh, why, how did, how did the population, when did the population start crashing and why? Uh, populations, oh. plural. Yeah. Well, the history of whaling, uh, is, uh, it, it's, it's a dark, uh, dark path to walk down. But if we're, you know, again, not looking at traditional communities that were, that were whaling and, and starting with European whaling and into the commercial industrialized whaling that starts in Europe around the 11th century. And it really took off globally in the 16th century. And fast forward by the mid 19th century, Massachusetts was the center of the whaling universe. It was the richest city per capita in the United States, if not the world. Um, this is written about in this fun news newspaper clipping I found from 1854 um, and they were, you know, being sold as, as, as products. I mean, it was, they were really a backbone of the American economy, um, throughout the 1800s into the early 1900s. The sperm oil was used to lubricate fancy new machinery. Whale oil lit up people's, uh, houses. Um, their cartilage was used to hold together corsets. I mean, there were as, as, you know, recently as the 1960s, Americans were consuming, um, whale oil uh, for a source of vitamin D. It was just like a normal household product you would buy. Um, and, and then with the rise of petroleum, that 
started to replace some of the whale oil, but they're still being hunted. They're hunted by Iceland, Norway, and Japan. They're the, the three countries that operate to do uh, commercial whaling now. Uh, there wasn't a ban on commercial until the 1980s, and this was really after a strong push by the environmental movement, the whole, of course, famous Greenpeace Save the Whales campaign, and thanks to you know, recordings like I'd mentioned with the, the humpback whale songs, people hearing those for the first time, whales started to shift in the public, public consciousness from game animals to, you know, cultural icons and, and creatures to be admired and, and to learn from. But this fight isn't over. I mean, we're, we're still, uh, we're still trying to <laughs> plead with these, these commercial whaling countries to, to please stop. And, and Japan is really at the helm of this. I'm, sure people have seen uh, some of the, the spectacle and theater of, of things like sea shepherds um, going out and having these very confrontational moments with with uh, the hunting ships. Uh, but Japan pulled out of the, the international uh, moratorium on commercial whaling uh, recently, which really they weren't following it to begin with. And um, the 1980s, the International Whaling Commission put a ban on all commercial whaling um, due to this, you know, the the highly publicized crash in their populations. And then quickly, right after that ban came out, there was this loophole that was created that said, well, you can go out and, and whale if it's for scientific purposes. And Japan went ahead and just said, okay, well, we're pulling up all of these whales for scientific purposes. Um, so it wasn't really a solution at all. Um, I can't really think of a a less effective um, international governmental body than the International Whaling Commission. And um, that's kind of saying a lot. So it's it's still the hunting is still a problem. And that's what we can blame for having wiped out the severe numbers of their populations. But the threats today are are mostly byproducts of our economy. Whales are dying from ship strikes. They're dying from getting tangled in nets. That is the, the leading cause of death for whales now. They can't swim without getting caught in nets. I mean, our seas are just littered with these nets that are, are mostly lobster nets. Uh, and they, they have these really painful, long drawn out, uh, deaths from just not being able to move, not being able to dive. I mean, just imagine these corded ropes just slowly, like just encasing the, their, their flesh and, and digging into it. And I mean, it's just ex excruciating. I mean, more so than a rocket harpoon. I mean, a rocket harpoon looks like a, um, a more charitable death compared to how they're dying slowly from these nets. So in, in no means are they, are they safe from human activity, even though we put out things like bands. Um, so I can understand very clearly how they would get stuck in a fishing net. Um, but what is a, what, what is the fixed lobster gear? How, uh, is it, is it just a rope and then they get tangled in a single rope? I don't, I don't, I can't picture the fixed lobster gear. They usually sit right off the coast where whales are, are coming in to forage and most of their, their feeding grounds are. And the way it works is there's this just a, a cage, a trap that sits at, at the bottom, you know, 60 to 100 feet under the sea, and it's attached by a rope or a series of rope that then goes to the top and sits at a buoy. So the they are left out there, and then after so many weeks, the the fishermen will come will, and and pull the buoys out of the water. That's how they locate them and find them. And what's extremely frustrating is if we want to uh, go ahead and let this industry, the lobster industry, which in America makes uh, half a billion dollars a year. Um, they have really strong lobbies and, you know, it's not going to go away anytime soon. But we do have a solution from a technological standpoint. There's something called a lineless trap where it doesn't have that buoy and it's uh, remote controlled and it actually just drifts up right when they need to pull it up. Um, but there's, despite the extreme amount of profits that there's making, there's just no money to be found to convert them over to this this other technology not to mention the organizing factor it's a decentralized industry and there's just a lot of resistance to changing um, a lot of these a lot of these people who are going out this is something that has been passed down to them bequeathed through their families and they just really it's it's a behavior change problem and so far as numbers uh, here's a quote from your article 
An estimated 300,000 whales and dolphins are killed globally each year as a result of the poorly regulated fishing industry compared with the few thousand taken by hunters. So it really is um, – fishing debris is really is, is a much bigger story than shooting them with harpoons. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you another uh, fact here that I mentioned the North Atlantic right whales earlier with the 400 individuals left. It's estimated that 85% of those 400 animals will become tangled in fishing gear in their lifetime. And 70% of those will become tangled again. And we have these things, we have like marine rescue centers that are set up uh, on our coastlines. And they're, they're usually nonprofits and work in cooperation with fishery management, uh, places like NOAA, um, NOAA, uh, which is, you know, woefully under, unfunded and has this sort of baked in conflict of interest. They're charged with both protecting whales and also protecting the, the fisheries and, and working with the, uh, the lobster fishers. So on, you know, on one hand, it's positive that they kind of know all the players and can cooperate, but at the same time, they can't fully pick the solutions that are going to protect for the whales. So, um, they're, yeah, they're not that, you know, many clear paths, um, for changing this problem. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's completely solvable. I think one of the, the most repeated things that I got when I was interviewing researchers and scientists who work for NOAA and these different fishery management places is that we have clear pathways to uh, be reducing uh, the number of deaths and, and we're just not taking them because there's just there's not the will there. Um, I want to go a slightly different direction for a second. And this is is generic plastic pollution a problem for whales as well. We hear about, you know, birds with stomachs full of plastic. And does that sort of thing happen with whales as well, or is that not as much of an issue? Yeah, plastic pollution and, and just pollution in general. It's just, again, an ecological concept known as bioaccumulation that, you know, you're eating all the smaller life forms who are also eating this pollution, and then it's going to accumulate in the massive bodies of the whales. And they... They have a parts per million uh, regulation for whether they're allowed to sell um, whale meat or or any seafood. So they check them for things like for uh, things like mercury and you know the Faroe Islands. There is this documentary done about their their traditional whaling community years ago, and they were they were interviewing the community members and and uh, saying like, look, you're the pilot whales that you're hunting have these you know set aside for the second whether it's moral for them to be hunting these, these animals. They just made it a, a human health issue and said they have such extreme amount of mercury in their blubber and this is poisoning your family. Are you going to keep eating whales? And they just, it was, you know, shocking. They were just so obstinate and they were like, yes, it's our tradition. We're going to keep eating whales. So absolutely pollution is, is um, a ubiquitous threat for them. So, and, and then another question is, I know that, as the uh, oceans are vacuumed of fish, that squid seem to be doing okay, which means that if squid are doing okay, then as the primary food of um, sperm whales, that sperm whales should, whatever other problems they're facing, they're, they're probably not starving to death. Um, and, and let me know if I'm wrong on that. And then, but, but the real question is, um, what about the collapse of fish populations? Is that also, uh, having, is that also harming whales in ways that you slash we collectively know? Do you see what I'm well, asking? Yeah. Well, so climate change is changing where their, where their feeding grounds are in general. So, feeding grounds that they've been reliably going to for, you know, arg arguably thousands of years are, are shifting. So we know in the case of humpback whales that their feeding grounds are shifting north. Um, they, they used to be more in Massachusetts. Now they're going into Canada. For, so from a management perspective, you know, they're scrambling to have to adjust to a new, uh, a new family of whales showing up and what that means for their, for their boundary waters. Um, but we, 
again, we just, we don't know. We, we can track certain birds that we know that will show up in, in areas where they're likely to feed and try to understand that. Um, the, the squid is an interesting, uh, bit though. Um, I, I love cephalopods. They have such an interesting evolutionary history themselves. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know that, that starvation or, or a lack of food is, um, top of the list for the problems. I mean, I think of krill, which is one of the main food sources for, for baleen whales. The sperm whales are a toothed whales. And, and I'll talk more about those in, in a minute because they have completely different orientations and language. They use echolocation. Um, and, and it's fascinating, but krill are, um, the most biodiverse animal on planet earth from a, a, a or uh, have the most biomass, um, weight of any animal on planet earth. And then they, uh, are present in the Antarctic where a lot of whales will migrate to, um, and, and feed there. And some whale species don't need to eat for a couple of months so they can go fill up on krill and then they're good for a little bit while they're traveling. Uh, and we do know that the, the krill, uh, is populations are depleting. So again, it's just really glimpsing the surface of, of removing, you know, parts of, of the ecosystem and sitting back to see what the new interactions, um, and depletions are, are going to be. We're just, you know, <laughs> it's just this like big colossal sad experiment that we're running and, and, and really not knowing the big picture yet. Um, but sperm whales are just a quick comment on their name. Um, they're named sperm whales because they were sort of burgeoned over the head, um, with, by the hunters. And they thought that the oil that was spilling out of their, it's called a, a melon, the top of the tooth whale head was, was sperm. So I, I guess they thought they were somehow just magically only pulling up males of the species. And that's why they were seeing it every time. Um, so that's, that's the history of how they, how they get their name. Um, they have the biggest brain of any animal uh, on planet Earth, and they just have this crazy system of communicating. They have their own um, dialects, depending on what populations that you're looking at. There, there are a few populations um, off the coast of Dominica that are pretty well studied, and they're starting to analyze the language with machine learning to put it into these series. They're called codas um, using their clicks. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it, it's extraordinary. They have, you know, complex cortexes in their brains, that, that part of the brain that the humans love and are so proud of. Um, and somehow with these, these big brains, they manage to go around and <laughs> not destroy the world. So we have a lot to learn from them. So I thought I heard you say something a couple of minutes ago, and maybe I misheard. Did you say that some can go without eating for a couple months? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's a pretty extraordinary thing, too, because they're warm-blooded creatures, and they're not hibernating. You know, I mean, I understand how bears can shut down if they if they go to sleep for a couple months or go into torpor, but yeah. they're doing that while they're moving. How does how does that work? I I wish I knew more in depth how, how their metabolisms work, and and I don't, but they... You know, and I'd be curious too, um, what their, what their weight fluctuation is, if it's really something that they're storing in their blubber <laughs> and if that's what's being affected and changing. Um, but it, it will add it to the list of unknowns and, and part of their mystery for now. I know that, um, there are some birds like Aleutian geese will fly two and a half weeks straight or two weeks straight from the coast of California up to the Aleutian Islands and they lose 25% of their mass. And I, I don't remember the number for hummingbirds, but hummingbirds, when they migrate across, especially like the Caribbean, um, they lose a similar amount of weight. Um, and they actually have to, before they go, they, they gain so much weight that they, they are way beyond their normal capacity. And so it's just fascinating to me how, Nature is just endlessly fascinating to me on how how they get by. Can you can you throw out um, before we before we move on? Can you throw out just a few of your favorite factlets about whales? Like different whales, how how long can some of them be underwater? Uh, how long can they go without breathing? How deep can they go? Or 
or I, I've I've heard some amazing things about how they exist in cold water and they have these interesting uh, heat exchange in their fins. Is it is it just I mean throw out some just cool stuff. Well, another thing about the the sperm whale communication, um, their sounds are are like clicks and it's the loudest sound by decibel of any animal uh, that gets emitted. It's something like 250 decibels. They can they can click or or sort of you know stun their prey to, to death with how loud this is and the vibration of it. And they create this sound in these air sacs that are in their in their head. And it's a little bit like if you imagine blowing air over the top of a bottle. It's you know the the pitch is determined by how much your air you're blowing and at what rate. And they're able to recycle this air so they can take a big gulp of oxygen and they can go under and they can continually be moving it around to be emitting these these clicks. It, I mean, it's extremely efficient, uh, um, energy efficient system for communicating it. It takes something like uh, 40 joules to make one sound. If you compare that to, you know, 40,000 joules of energy it takes for them to surface um, and you could hear them in these recordings to, you know, making that sucking sound just like a in, and that's, that's the sound of them recycling. Uh, in terms of breathing, you know, most mo- of them can hold their breath for, I think it's probably on, uh, a maximum of about two hours, probably more like 90 minutes, um, when they're going under. And, and again, I mean, you know, they surface and, and we have these, these pictures, these great pictures of them leaping and, and, and playing and, um, and being out of water. But, you know, it's a little bit of a nuisance for them to be surfacing. I mean, really a lot of their socializing is, is take, is taking place underwater. And, um, that's what I'm most curious about. And when I interview these, uh, these whale experts, uh, on what they would, they wish they were studying if they didn't have to be studying how they're dying, it, it's really their, their complex social, um, behaviors and, and they're intensely cooperative. They're organized into, into matriarchies. Um, and they, they have, uh, like humpback whales will, uh, blow bubbles, um, you know, as a form of communication. Um, so again, we just really don't know all of the ways that they're, they're interacting and moving around and going to these great depths together. So, I know that your answer is probably going to be that we don't know, but <laughs> I, I've heard I've heard stories of uh, young orphaned way I'm sorry young orphaned elephants who whose parents were killed by poachers who then turn into nasty little nasty big creatures who do terrible terrible things like rape rhinoceroses to death and. In Africa, they didn't know what to do about these these young gangsters, whatever you want to call them, and um, juvenile delinquents, I guess. Anyway, um, what they what they finally figured out to do is to send in one of the grandmas, and she basically whipped them into shape pretty quick. <laughs> and again, it would be so much harder to study because you can't sit there with binoculars and you know watch them across across the valley. But do we know – I mean, how do we know it's a matriarchy? How do we know – what do we know about what the what the mothers or grandmothers tell them? Well, we also know that elephants are, are matriarchies. Katie Payne, who I had mentioned earlier, she's a wonderful scientist. She's, uh, I believe, in her 70s now. She studied both whales and, and elephants and uh, has looked a lot at the um, – uh, how we, how we know about these matriarchal, uh, lineages and connections. And, uh, we, you know, especially with, with humpback whales who are probably the most well studied, we, we have their family systems mapped over a few generations and, and they're named and all their connections are established. And we look at things like who, you know, how are the decisions being made for the, for the pods and, and how how are the foraging or hunting behaviors being passed down and and that's coming that's coming from the females um and 
you know, we see behaviors like if there's a, a, a shark or a predator coming, you know, it's really the females who are organizing the more vulnerable individuals in into the center of, of a pod and, and forming this protection. So we have enough op- observations to say that, you know, the females are really the ones who are are um, helping with, you know, the decision making for the whole and, and making sure that the decisions are um you know, beneficial to the whole. I mean, one of the one of the ways that they were um, hunt so well hunted is that whales will reliably come to the rescue of of other whales. Um, so they would take you know a young and know that the mom was going to come after it, and so was the rest of the pod to come and and help protect it. And so you know they got the the whole family for the price of of siphoning off the young. Um, it was just you know using this this knowledge to exploit them. Um, and there just, there really needs to be a profound shift to, to use, you know, instead this knowledge to, to learn something from them. We just, we have so much to learn, uh, from how they, they relate to each other and, and what they offer the world. So to your knowledge, um, how do they, um, so if, if the females are in charge of the pod, do, are, are males sent off to find a new pod? Uh, how do they, how do they have exo- exogenous marriage? <laughs> um, I, I know more about this with birds. I don't, I don't know exactly what the, what the walkabout is for, for the male whales and, uh, what the, how they endeavor to go find mates. And, um, I, you know, I think with, with something like the, the sperm whale populations that are off the coast of Dominica, there are something like three distinct populations and I think you do see that exchange of males between those pods. This happens a lot with, um, with mammals. Of, of course, I think earlier you had mentioned, um, uh, maybe wolves or coyotes. Um, you know, they do this. They'll, they'll go travel and find a, another family to be a part of. Um, and so I, I would assume it's the same, but I don't know exactly. So, and this is a weird question, but I know that among wolves who leave the pod and, or not the pod, the, the pack and, move to find a different home or to establish a new pack, um, oftentimes, especially when you take humans out of the picture, their main threat is other wolves. That when a new wolf comes into a territory, they're not met with open open paws. And is that true with whales too? And I know we're talking, when we're talking whales, we're talking a bunch of different species with probably much mm-hmm. different behavior. But do they have, do they have, if there's a lot of them, like right now, there's not so many. But if there were a lot of of whales in the ocean, would they defend territory from incursion? Like bears, the mother, the, the females will have territory. The males usually don't, and the females will chase off other females if they try to come in. And do you know anything about 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 conflicts between interests, intra species conflict between whales? I, I would, so the tooth whales, um, and, and dolphins, um, orcas are sort of known as being the more aggressive, uh, cetaceans. They're, they're, um, you know, they have to cooperate to hunt and they sometimes get a bad rap for just playing with a sea lion <clears throat> before it's totally dead. Things like this, flinging it around the parts of the nature documentary that they cut. Um, but I, I really think of most of the species of whales as, you know, taking the route of cooperation um, over the aggressive behavior. And I'm not sure specifically with with the mates, um, how territorial um, they would be. I mean, let's keep in mind that a, a gestation period for a whale is one of the longest ones of all mammals. So um, if I was if I was a female whale, I wouldn't necessarily be um, competing with uh, the other female to get pregnant. I'd be like, you know, you go you go ahead, you take care of that. Uh, I'll I'll get the birthday gifts. Um, but uh, that's another another interesting thing to learn more about. And we haven't mentioned yet. As long as we're talking about cetaceans, can we give a brief shout out to the um, freshwater cetaceans like the 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 river dolphins can you just like just sort of briefly bow to them because they live in the sea mainly but there are a few species who do live in in freshwater yeah there are the um the pink river dolphin in um bolivia i was uh, fortunate enough to see a couple of years ago they're they're gorgeous and really playful 
Um, the most endangered of all cetaceans is a, a river dolphin that lives in China. Uh, and I, I mean, I think there are just a few left in captivity and their numbers plummeted due to a dam that was put in um, on a river. But I mean, when you think back 50 million years ago, whales evolved from uh, this, you know, four limbed sort of semi aquatic very um, goofy looking if you look at some of the artistic renderings of it creature that um, that dwelled along riverbanks and over that 50 million uh, year span transformed into having these you know gorgeous long flippers and and the rest of it so the river the river dolphins to me really harken back to some of the evolutionary origins as well so you have said several times uh, well let's go to what I think was, um, the most important line of of your wonderful article, um, which is that uh, it is it was and is desperate times for whales, and I think you made that pretty clear. Um, what am I trying to say? Uh, how? Given, given the, oh wait, there's, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there's one more topic I want to talk about first, which is you haven't talked about noise pollution in the oceans. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, think about a song traveling thousands of miles and how sensitive your hearing has to be to detect that, let alone a ship that's um, putting out these, these massive amounts of, of uh, noise and hearing that. I mean, to try to avoid it, Whales are just going you know, as deep as they can underwater. Um, some of them are beaching themselves or or surfacing at such a rate that their um, that their organs are actually exploding from um, you know the the depressurization not happening um, at a gradual rate. And so yeah, it's v extremely noisy. They can't hear each other. They can't hear each other to to find feeding grounds. And I mean, coming back to finding mates, they can't find they can't hear each other to to mate and and be together it's um it's a huge problem and i had mentioned the ship strikes earlier um it's not nearly as significant as a problem as the the running into the nets but it accounts for about you know 20 percent of their deaths now as the ships just colliding into their bodies when they're they're coming into the um the shipping channels to then dock on the coast um so you know everything that humans are are doing to industrialize the sea is just is massively problematic for whales and i think you know the desperation is that a lot of this is is sort of just part of our inherent in our economic system i mean our economic system is willing to tolerate this this death and there's um you know there's the, one of the solutions that's proposed is uh is called environmental economics and it's this idea that well if you just get you know, fisheries and, and, uh, you know, Amazon, who's sending out all of these, these ships to deliver products all over the world to, uh, do something that's called full cost accounting. And it's basically meant to, uh, incentivize them towards the, the social good. Um, and they're supposed to take what's called externality. So whale death would be thought of as an externality. Um, in this economic, in this in economic solution and in what they call it internalizing it. Uh, so, you know, you imagine on their spreadsheet, there's going to be a line for whale deaths and then they're going to go ahead and do cost benefit analysis and decide how much they're going to care about this whale death. And I mean, it's still, it's completely disembodied and, um, and, and rationalized to this really sick degree. And that's our best solution to include the lives of whales, let alone all the other species into this current economic system. I mean, it's absolutely at odds, um, with the lives of whales and, and that's not the pathway to solve it. Um, but it, it really comes down to this, uh, it, it, some, to me, it's, it's, it's this huge moral problem and it's this, um, it's this indifference and this willingness to tolerate the fact that they're dying. I mean, going into this, like I go into so many projects and, and field studies and learning about the lives of other species, I kind of hold a, a sliver that, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're okay. Maybe there's a chance to recover. Maybe something could happen. And, 
and the loss is always so much more and the deaths are always so much more than even someone like myself who who sort of you know counts her, counts herself as a cynic and i think cynics are really you know the the biggest dreamers among us because they imagine how the world could be how rich it could be i'm was shocked at the state of wales i mean it's just absolutely um, unfathomable to me that we are losing them at the rate that we are, um, considering how, how spectacular and, and, and marvelous and how, um, beautiful and, and deep their lives are. And that we're willing to put up with them dying in these horrendous and systematic is, is absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for bringing that up about the, um, the, the sort of best hope of a lot of people is to uh, attempt to uh, draw them into the economic system by doing a, quote, full cost accounting. And I have two big problems with that. One of them is that how is this enforced when those in power, I mean, they don't even do full cost accounting of the harm to humans for the most part. And second, I did a I was doing a, a, a talk by Skype one time at Yale or Harvard. I think it was Yale. And there were several people in the audience who were really pushing the uh, the full cost accounting as, as the solution. And I wasn't able to get through to them. And finally, I said, you know, actually, I think the full cost accounting of of deaths is a great idea. And in fact, it's such a great idea that I was talking to your parents before this event and um, we figured out that since you're at an Ivy League school, you're probably going to make your, your lifetime earnings are probably going to be about $4 million, which means that your current estimated value is about a million. So I got some good news and bad news. And the bad news is that I'm going to kill you. And the good news is that I way overpaid your parents. I gave them five million <laughs> bucks and they did the calculations on the back of an envelope and they like they jumped at the five million dollars and they didn't get it. <laughs> and and that's really the point is that if you bring it into the economic system, you wouldn't. You. OK, I'm going to make an assumption here. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that you would not sell your. Siblings or sell your lover or sell anyone else that you care about to a serial killer for a <laughs> bunch of money and just internalize that cost. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. I, I mean, it would depend probably on my mood and, you know, how nice they'd been to me lately, but uh, generally no. I mean, it's like ask, it's like saying, yes, you can have your death camp, but we're going to put a tax on it. Um, you know, and it really takes going down to that level because humans have this extraordinary ability to, to delude themselves and, it's not until you ask that question, well, what what's your life worth? What's what's the worth of your loved ones? And, you know, we're asking these questions like, what is the wilderness worth? What are the lives of other animals worth? And we're willing to over rationalize to the point of of complete, you know, deception and and um, insanity. I mean, I, I study environmental economics the way that um a psychologist, you know, might study things like, you know, psycho, you know, insanity or, you know, psychopathy. It's just this, I do it because I have to do it to try to come up with critiques and engage and, and it's, it's part of the conversation now, but, you know, it's not with any joy or hope that it's going to be something that's going to transform our economic system, which is, you know, just our ways of living in a way that's going to make a difference for many hu human communities um, and, of course, countless of other species that we share this planet with. So we have just a couple of minutes left. And what do you want people to do, listeners to this, to do with the information that you've given them? What do you want them? Yeah. What do you want them to do with this information, with this knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> I I always I, I hear this question asked of so many people and I always sit there scoffing or being frustrated when, you know, these sort of little little solutions and amendments are, are proposed like, OK, well, maybe don't buy some lobster or be willing to pay, you know, ten ten dollars more for your lobster roll. And then we'll hope that they get this lineless technology. But that's just that's just not going to solve it. I I think really it's 
it's asking those deep, profound moral questions about what is the worth of of you know life on earth what is the worth of the wilderness what is the worth the worth of your loved ones because that's the point we're at if we want to uh if we want our own species to continue into the future if we want to share a planet that's rich in in whale song and and songs of all of these other creatures then we need to radically and drastically transform the ways that we're living and we have to ask the tough questions of of, of, you know, how, how we're living and what we're willing to tolerate. And so I, I think it would be just a call for people to, um, be as uncomfortable as possible, um, and really denouncing, uh, some of these, you know, lighter, more everybody, everybody can get their Amazon package and everyone can have their lobster roll and it's going to be fine, um, solutions that are, are really distracting us right now. Well, thank you so much for that, and and thank you so much for all of your great work in the world. And hey, we should have saved this till after. I should save this till after the interview. But you want to do an interview just on on uh, on full cost accounting sometime? Sure, absolutely. I'd love to roast it with you. Okay, great. So anyway, I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Kate Bosler. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> 